So as a church, we are believing that 2020 is going to be a beautiful year. We're believing that this is going to be a beautiful year in all of our lives. But not just that, we're believing that this is going to be beautiful beginning. It's going to be a big, beautiful beginning from the very start of this month all the way through 2020. Uh, the word that we're trusting God uh, with this year is Isaiah chapter 43 from verse 18 to 19. Isaiah 43, 18 to 19 is a scripture that if you don't know it yet, we will all become very familiar, I'm sure, in the coming weeks and months. It says, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do, for I am about to do something new. It says, see, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. How beautiful is that scripture? How powerful, how encouraging, how much hope does that scripture give us? But the reality with this scripture is that the manifestation of the scripture or the manifestation of the word completely depends on our faith. You know, it is our faith that is going to really have an impact on how this word manifest in our lives. Throughout the Bible, we see Jesus speaking very powerful words into the lives of people who had different expectations. And as he spoke, he always referred to their faith. So if you look in the book of Luke chapter 10, if you read from verse 1 through to 10, you have the centurion man who had a, a servant who was ill and he came to Jesus and he asked Jesus to help heal his servants, right? He said, Jesus, you're not worthy or I'm not worthy of you coming into my home. But if you send a word, it will be done. And in accordance to this man's faith, his servant was healed by the time they got home. Uh, one chapter down, if you look in Luke chapter 8, you have the woman with the issue of blood. Uh, she, what did she do? She tried to, well, she touched the helm of Jesus's garment and when Jesus felt that someone had touched him, he asked and she spoke and she said, if I could just touch the helm of your garments, I will be made whole. And what did Jesus say to her? He says, your faith has healed you in verse 48. And so she was healed. He said, your faith has healed you and she was healed. Uh, if you look in Matthew chapter 9, uh, Jesus was walking and he came across two blind men who were pleading with him to have mercy on them. They were practically, the way the scripture puts it is they were pleading with Jesus. So they were pleading for mercy. And he asked them, he said, do you believe that I can heal you? And they replied, yes. And he touched their eyes. And what did he say? He says, in accordance to your faith, let it be done and their sight were restored. So everything you see, all of these things, it was in accordance to their faith. It might have touched them or they might have touched him, but it was still their faith that was going to heal them. And I believe in the same way it applies to our faith or healing, in the same way the, the sort of the manifestation of their healing came I think it also applies to when we are trusting God for the fulfillment of his word in our lives. So not just in instances when you want to be healed, but when you are trusting God for his word to be fulfilled. So a word may be spoken just as a word has been spoken concerning GLC in 2020 and concerning us this month. But the manifestation of that word is entirely dependent on us as the recipients of that word. So it is entirely dependent on us. So my prayer is that God's word that has been spoken into our lives, that we will receive it and it will manifest in our lives, that we shall all testify to a beautiful beginning, to a beautiful year in 2020. We'll testify to it in our finances, in our homes, in our relationships, in everything that we do, we will experience beautiful things, beautiful beginning in Jesus' name. So if I step back a little bit, um, Five Nights of Grace, I think for me, you spoke about it when you shared your testimony. Sadly, I missed uh, most of Five Nights of Grace. Uh, the last night was crossover service, which I didn't miss. And when pastor was praying, uh, during prayer, um, he said, 
I think I wrote it down, he says that 2020 will be a beautiful year. He hadn't explicitly, or at that point, I didn't know that that was the intention for, for that to be the word for the year. But he said 2020 will be a beautiful year. And uh, my spirit caught onto it. I latched onto when you said it. And I really believed it. And I really had that conviction. So when I went home, literally the 1st of January, I didn't go to bed. I started drawing out my mind map of what the year was going to bring or what my expectations were. What were the things that I was looking to God for a beautiful beginning? I wasn't doing one year. I was doing a, a decade. You know, I did one a decade ago. Ten years later, I thought, Let, let's do another one and let's see what God is going to do. And I had so much confidence because you had declared when you spoke that it was going to be a beautiful year. So I was bold. I was ambitious in the things that I was trusting God for. But even though I was being bold and ambitious, there was still this little nudging in me that was like, how is this going to be possible? Now, that nudging is my logical side because I like to believe I'm a very logical person. So not just a, I want this, but actually, how is it going to be manifested? But I tried my best not to feed that nudging in any way. I was trying my best to put it away and to just dream and to trust God for the things that he was going to do. And at the same time, I was asking myself, God, how am I going to trust you? How, how, what do I need to do to trust you for these things so that that nudging can go away? So this morning, I want to speak to us about trusting or the key to trusting God for a beautiful beginning. The key to trusting God for a beautiful beginning. How many of us have expectations for a beautiful beginning? How many of us know what that thing we're trusting God is, that beautiful thing that we're trusting God? How many of us feel like it's something that we can probably attain ourselves, that we have the power of some sort to be able to do? No, wonderful, perfect. Okay, so that makes my message very relevant to all of us this morning. It is the key to trusting God for a beautiful beginning. The very first thing that I want to focus on or the very first key is that you cannot depend on your limited sight. Sight is an S-I-G-H-T, Jesus. Sight, you cannot depend on what you see. By sight, I am referring to the things that you see. And the dictionary defines sight as, or to see rather, as to perceive by the eyes. It is what you see with your eyes. And we all rely on our eyes to see things. You know, more than anything else, we believe the things that we have seen. If I walk into a room with my eyes open, or if you all walked into this room, as long as I have my glasses on or maybe contact lenses, I am sure of the things that I see. I am sure that this is Dr. John. I am sure that that is Pastor. I'm sure that that's Laulu over there. So I am sure of the things that I see. Equally, if I close my eyes and you walked into a room, if I hear your voice, I might be sure it's you, but my degree of confidence may just reduce a little bit just because I haven't confirmed it with my eyes. So there's a little bit of a pause. I might be like, that's pastor, but the, that's because I know you more. But if it's somebody else that I don't quite know as well, there might be a little degree of doubt. You know, my, my confidence in you is 100%. Not seeing you becomes 99.9%. .9%. So there's still an, an ounce of doubt in that. So I wrote down in the same way, our faith works like that, or, our, or what we need rather is, let me rephrase, we need our eyes to see. We trust our eyes, and the Bible helps us to know the importance of our eyes. In Matthew uh, 6.23, it says, the eyes are the light of the body this scripture is referring to both your physical eyes, but also your spiritual eyes, right? So your physical eyes are the light to your body to help you see, but your spiritual eyes are also the light to the body to help you see. But what they help you see is different. What they help you see is different from the things that you can see in the physical. Your physical eye reveals the physical things, but your physical eye cannot perceive spiritual things your physical eye cannot perceive spiritual reality so when you are trying to trust God for something that you can't see in the physical 
It's not your physical eyes that you're going to need to to search with. It's your spiritual eyes. Amen. The spirit realm is just as real as the physical realm. Uh, A few months ago in Sunday school, we were talking about this very thing in Heaven's Gate class, if you're you're part of that class. And we were talking about, (laughs) plug, uh, we were talking about specifically understanding things of the spirit. And I really have come to realize that it becomes much easier to comprehend this Christian journey and the things of God when you understand how the spiritual realm works. Right, because Bible says in Second Corinthians two fourteen, it says, "But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, but they are foolishness to him; nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned." So the things of God are spiritually discerned. Your physical man or your physical eyes are not going to tell you those things. You need to use your spiritual eyes. Amen. Are you following me? Okay. So the first thing I want you to know is that every human has spiritual eyes. So we, God gave us all spiritual eyes uh, so that we could comprehend the spiritual realities of life. But not everybody uses them. You know, scripture helps us to understand that God has given it to those who trust Christ. But those who don't trust Christ are spiritually blind. They cannot see uh, Paul was writing, he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 3 to 4, he says, Our gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. By that he means those who are unbelievers who do not know God. So it's only the spirit that gives us spiritual sight where we start to see things, and that only comes when we are born again. So if you're born again, you're able to see with your spiritual eyes or you have the spiritual eyes to see. Does that make sense? But I realize that even those who are born again, sometimes we struggle to see with our spiritual eyes. Definitely something that resonates with me where I'm seeking clarity on something, but I just can't seem to see it beyond the physical. So I can't actually quite focus in with my spiritual eyes. So I realize that sometimes even born again Christians we struggle to see with our spiritual eyes. So I asked myself, God, how do I develop my spiritual eyes? You know, how can I improve my spiritual vision? And the only word God had for me is that the only way you do it is by deepening your relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know, your spiritual eyes relies on the Holy Spirit. So the deeper that relationship is with the Holy Spirit, the clearer your vision becomes, the clearer you can see. In Ephesians 1.18, it says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance, etc. So the Holy Spirit is your spiritual eyes. The Holy Spirit helps you to see what God is doing. So then how do we deepen our relationship with the Holy Spirit? Then becomes a question. So the first thing we have to do is that we have to interact with the Holy Spirit the very same way we will interact with any person that we can see in the physical. If you came to midweek service um, this week, uh, Minister Richard, Pastor Richard was teaching and he was teaching about the person of the Holy Spirit. And what he said was that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it right? He is a person. And so because he's a person, we have to engage with him as a person. Uh, If we read 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 13, 4, it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We say this every day, right? Or we say this when we share the grace, whenever we we convene together, before we depart, we actually share this. But this scripture dawned in me that it actually captures the essence of the different aspects of the Trinity, right? So you have Jesus Christ, who is the grace of God, who is the unmerited favor. So he is the grace in that way because he's unmerited favor. We don't deserve him but he came freely. So he's given us that grace freely. And that is why he is the grace of God. 
that scripture says God is love. So that is one of his key attributes. If you read 1 John 4, 8, it describes God as love. And it says the Holy Spirit is the fellowship or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And I'll say, why is it saying fellowship with the Holy Spirit? And I realize that it's very simple, right? For Jesus died, he said, I'm sending one who will be with you. So he is the one that we have time or that we spend time with, that we can engage with, that we can fellowship with. So when God is telling us that we need to deepen our relationship with the Holy Spirit, saying to know more of me, to know more of my will and my plans, this is the person who's going to help you. You know, search my word, but it's the Holy Spirit that's going to reveal those things to you. Where it doesn't make sense, he will make it clear and it will help us to understand. Amen? So, like I said, the first thing that we have to do is engage with the Holy, or Holy Spirit. We have to fellowship with him like you will fellowship with anyone in the physical. You have to speak with him. You know, if you're in a relationship and the other person don't speak to you, what do you do after a while? You walk out, right? You're like, I'm, I'll go find other friends. I'll go make new friends. I pray that the Holy Spirit will never leave any of us in this room. But if we don't engage him, if we don't interact with him, then we can't actually detect or we, can't, we don't realize when that spirit is speaking to us. Does that make sense? Thank you. So the second way that to deepen our relationship uh, with the Holy Spirit follows on from that. As born-again Christians, fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit has been gifted to us. I said earlier that Jesus was made sin on our behalf. He died for us for that very purpose that we may be able to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And what I realize is when, when Jesus was speaking, he says he's given us the Spirit. And when I focused in on that, what, what stood out to me was that he's given us the Spirit, not a portion of the Spirit, right? Because when you have a portion of it, there's still room for uncertainty, right? There's still room to be like, oh, I, don't, I don't quite have a full picture. You know, think about somebody that you know you know them from a distance, you call them an acquaintance, right? They're not, you don't have a personal relationship with them. But somebody that you know very closely, you know them in their entirety, right? You know your wife in her entirety, I would say, right? So it changes the nature of your relationship. So because we have the spirit in its fullness, we have God in his fullness, we can connect with him in his fullness, and we, we should give him the time that he deserves in that way because he's given us all of him, right? He's given us his spirit in his entirety. And so we should engage with and entertain that spirit in his entirety. Um, there are many more ways to uh, deepen your relationship with the Holy Spirit. But I'll stop there because I will encourage you to be part of midweek service where we're talking about the Holy Spirit or uh, to be part of Holy Spirit Weekend, which is coming up the last weekend of this month. So if you want to know more about the Holy Spirit, growing, building your relationship with the Holy Spirit, then I will encourage you to be part of Midweek Service and the Holy Spirit Weekend. So my first point that I started with um, at the beginning is that you can't depend on your sight you can't depend on your physical uh, sight particularly and my point is this one of the key way to trust in God for a beautiful beginning is that we have to shift from using our physical eyes to using our spiritual eyes to help us see the things of God we have to let our spiritual sight let it guide what we expect let it guide what we are trusting God for and let it reveal the beautiful things that God has in store for us. So it is our spirit that is going to reveal those things to us. So if you're not hearing it, then you know that you need to spend more time with the Holy Spirit. You need to fellowship more with the Holy Spirit so that you can come to understand those things. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what is the second key to what I mentioned? The second key to trust in God for a beautiful beginning is that you can't depend on your own insight. So not your eyes this time, but your insight. And insight refers to what you know 
or the conclusions that you're able to draw from what you know. So if I give you an example, um, I earn X amount and based on that knowledge, it gives me insight that I can save X amount this year. So that is an insight that I've drawn from knowledge, from the experience. That is an insight. Another example is at work, uh, we do retros. And retros are where you turn knowledge of what has happened, you draw learnings from it, and then you apply it to how you deliver things in the future. So each year, or every time we do a project actually, we do retros, we come together, we say, okay, what can we learn from the way we've done this? And what does this mean for us in the future? Um, in the business world, it makes complete sense to do retros because you need that insight, you need that lesson or the, the knowledge from the past to help you shape the future. And even in our personal lives, it makes some degree of sense, right? But um, I wrote down, when you're trusting God for something beautiful, you can't operate on that type of insight alone. You can't depend on that type of insight alone because it limits God. Uh, and frankly, it leads to disappointment for you, right? It leads to disappointment for us when we rely on our insight or when we're depending on our insight alone. In Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verse, verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. You know, there's a reason why God has put that scripture there, right? There's a reason why he's saying, don't trust on what you know. You know, don't trust on the things that you know only, but lean on me. Don't lean on your own understanding. So in the same way you need the spiritual eyes to help you see, you also need the Holy Spirit to help you and to reveal things that you don't know to you. You know, John the Baptist was speaking and he says that the spirit will reveal to us, right? So you need insights beyond what you know and you can't rely on yourself for that. Now, something beautiful happened uh, in John chapter 20, verse 22. After Jesus had been resurrected and his disciples were waiting in a room for him, he came in into that room and Bible says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Um, if you look at the same story in, in, in the book of Luke, it's in chapter 24, you get a clearer picture of exactly what Jesus was doing. In Luke 24, 45, in the English Standard Version, it says he opened their understanding that they might understand the scripture. So what Jesus was doing was he breathed on them. He gave them the Holy Spirit. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. And the reason he did that was that so that they might understand the scripture. Because the reality is anybody could pick up the scripture and read it, but it means nothing to you unless you have the Holy Spirit to help you understand and to reveal the unknown things to you in that scripture. That's why you might read a scripture over and over and over again, but the revelation is different each time. You know, it's the Holy Spirit revealing different aspects to you. So I wrote on that he wasn't going to be around to guide them anymore, right? So Jesus was going up. So he said, the Holy Spirit, you need the Holy Spirit to help you understand. And what this helped to you, or what this revealed to me is that you can't rely on your past experiences. Your experiences, you relying on them depends too much on the past, Right, It depends too much on the past and you can't depend too much on the past to shape your insights or your thoughts on the beautiful things that God is going to do. Otherwise, we limit him. You know, We limit what he's able to do when we look at it based on where we are coming from. Does that make sense? Job was going for a very difficult time, right? It probably one of the person who had the biggest struggles in the Bible. And God told him in Job chapter 8, verse 7, he says, your beginning was small, but your latter days will be very great. Now, Job could have said, look at everything I've been going through. How is this going to be great? Like, I've lost everything. There's no way this can be great. But Bible tells us that his portion, what was it, was doubled, so even though his beginning days or certainly the middle phase of his life was terrible, his latter days were great. 
And that's why the scripture that we're trusting in God for is so important. That Isaiah 43 verse 18, he says, but forget all that. God is telling us, forget the past, forget your past experiences, forget what you know, forget what you've experienced, forget the former things, don't dwell on them. He says, I am doing a new thing. You know, we are limited with our knowledge. We are limited with our experiences. And so we have to forget the old things when we're trusting God for the new. We can't rely on our own insights. You know, our insights is not only limited, but if we rely on them, we might actually misread the things that God is planning to do. We might misread the way he's preparing us, right? He's preparing you for greatness, but you're struggling right now, so you think it's impossible, but you're misreading it because you don't know that this is part of the journey to greatness. Amen. So when God called Abraham, if we all remember, he made him a promise, right? He said to him, I'm going to make you, or your descendants will be many, was exactly what he said. So the first time God spoke to him in Genesis 15, he said to him, your, your descendants will be many. And he made him a covenant also that his son will be the only heir to, to, to the kingdom that he was about to give him. God even went as far as taking him outside and saying, look at the stars. Can you count them? If you can, that is as great or that is as many as your descendants are going to be, right? So here was a man that was being made all of these promises. But somehow, arguably, his past experiences and the reality of what Sarah, the age, the fact that she, she hadn't had any children so far, those circumstances that were in front of them right there was telling them a different story, right? That was how Sarah arguably was able to persuade him that God might have said this, but let's evaluate things right now. Let's look at what's going on and let's ask ourselves, am I really going to be the one? You know, God may have promised you children, but it doesn't have to be me. But that's not what God intended, right? As we all come to know. So they misunderstood Sarah particularly misunderstood what God intended or how God intended to work. So we have to be careful that we don't misunderstand. Again, in Isaiah 43, 18, God says, do you not see it? That tells me that God wants us to be able to see the beautiful things that he's doing. It's not a secret. You know, he's not hiding it from us. He's not keeping it that I'll tell you this part today. Next week, I'll reveal that. But he can do that. But this scripture, he's asking you, do you not see it? You know, sometimes our past experiences limits our ability to see what is happening in front of our very eyes. So what does that tell me? That tells me that a new beginning must start with an end to the old. We have to be able to let the old go. The old doesn't count when God is going to start a new thing. You know, in Mark 2, 22, it says you can't pour new wine into old wine skin. And every time we read those scriptures, we have to ask ourselves, God, why are you saying this? Because it makes complete sense. Logically, it makes sense, but the Spirit will help us understand even more. It doesn't make sense for you to want to embark on the new and still carry the old baggage with you. You know, God wants to start a new thing in your life, in my life, in this church. So we have to trust him. And the way we do that is we let go of the old. We let go of what we know. We let go of our past experiences. And we start afresh with him. We say, God... This is day one. You know, I'm ready to go on this journey with you. I know that your ways are not my ways. So, Father, give me your perspective on this matter. Give me your perspective on this journey that I'm about to start. Help me understand what you are doing. I don't want to judge this. I don't want to judge where I am based on my own insight. I want to know your ways. I want to know your insight into this. Isaiah 55 uh, verse 8 is a scripture we know. God is saying to us, for your thoughts are not, or for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor is your ways my way. He does things differently. At the end of last year, I think it was crossover service, Pastor and I were talking, or just before crossover service, and I was asking him, do you think 
God measures like New Year with the same sort of emphasis and the same way we think about it? Do you think that matters to God in the same way? Like, right, it's a new year. Let me let me release the blessings of this year. And our conclusion was yes and no in some way. So it wasn't like, yes, you know, time doesn't matter to God, but it does matter at the same time. So when we are seeking God for the new, or when we're trusting him for the new, don't think you have to wait till February for the new to start. The new could start right here. You know, there's no trigger point to say this is it. It is all about God's timing. It says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, my thoughts than your thoughts. God's way is way higher than ours so we shouldn't even try to comprehend it we should just go with the flow trust in him that he will make sense of it he will work it out somehow my siblings laughed at me so much when I was like I'm gonna get a new car for free my brother was like if you're gonna rub a shop don't ruin our surname just put it that way but I was like God's way are not your ways right I'm going to see them today the first thing I'm gonna say is God's way is not your way to him so we have to trust God. And when we're trusting him, we have to trust him for his way, not our way. So let's, ha well, let's focus on God for a minute. And how do we actually come to understand his ways? The Bible says in Deuteronomy 28 verse 2, it says, All these blessings will come to you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. So when we want to understand God's way, don't make it up as you go along you know obey his word obey the things that he's telling us right the more we obey God the more he can trust to reveal things to us right if God can't trust you with the little and your obedience in the little there's no point in him revealing the beautiful bigger things that he has planned for you does that make sense so on my second point I said one of the key ways to trust in God for a beautiful beginning is not to rely on your own insight. I'm going to make my very uh, last point. I'm conscious of time. But the third way or the key third way is to remove your blindfolds. Remove the blindfolds that you have. So we all know the story of Joseph. We know what happened with him and his brothers selling him and what then became of them. So they had a good end or a different beginning in the end. But after Joseph and all his brothers had died, they were the, uh, they were the Israelites, right? The Israelites continued to increase. They continued to increase and to prosper. And when uh, the, the pharaohs saw that they were doing so well, they were arguably a little bit scared and they forced them into slavery, right? And after several hundreds of years, we all know the story, God came along using Moses to rescue the Israelites from the hands of the Egyptians and to take them to the promised land. It was a perfect new beginning that God had planned for them. So they had struggled for so long. They'd been in this horrible land where they were slaved, slaves and God had a perfect new beginning planned for them. And in Exodus chapter 13, we can read about how they crossed the Red Sea and God brought them to this new beginning. And they celebrated, they danced, and they rejoiced in chapter 14. So they were so happy when God brought them away, particularly as they crossed the Red Sea. It gave them so much confidence. But literally a matter of days, or literally a matter of months, I think it was exactly two months, after they'd experienced all these amazing things, they had this confidence of this new beginning, they started complaining. You know, they started complaining that, God, you might as well have killed us in Egypt. You know, we're hungry, we're tired. If you read Ex Exodus chapter 16 from verse 2 to 3, it was saying, God, we wish you just killed us and left us with the Egyptians. So these were people who were completely blind to what God was doing before their very eyes. And you see that from that time on, time and time again throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites just weren't making good use of the new beginning that God was giving them. They just didn't see, they didn't recognize it, right? They just thought we would have been better off where we were. Even though they were going into a new land, they didn't see it at all. They were blinded. And God tried a number of times, you know, to help them over and over again. He tried to help them see what precious gift he had given them. 
But unfortunately, they were too blind to see it. And they were blinded by their greed, by fear, by sin, by all sorts of things that they just couldn't see. And as a result of that, their beautiful new beginning ended up being pain and more suffering and more distance from God. Let that not be our story. You know, God has a beautiful beginning plan for us, but we have to take off our blindfold to be able to see what he has planned. You know, we have to be able to trust God that he is going to fulfill his word and he's going to fulfill his promises. And sometimes we have to realize that our very desires can be the blindfold. The things that we want for ourselves can actually be the blindfold because God is doing X and you're still at A. You're still caught up on A that he hasn't done. You're still thinking about A. Oh, God, why don't I have A? But God, I need A. But God, I want A. You're just moaning and complaining. And God is saying, can't you see where you are? Can't you see that you are an X? Can't you see that I'm taking you beyond? A is just small in the grand scheme of what I want to do for you. So let's make sure that we take off our blindfolds. I am over my time. I'm going to ask you to rise on your feet and we're going to take one prayer point only. In everything that I've shared, what really resonated with me was the need to take off the blindfolds, the need to take off the things that are a distraction, the things that are causing us not to see what God is doing. And for me personally, God revealed to me that it's my desires that could be the blindfold for me. And I want you to search yourself and whatever you feel is a blindfold, I want you to ask God to help you with that very thing, to help you to see beyond that blindfold, to see beyond that thing that you might be desiring or that thing that's just causing you not to see what God is doing. It could be sin. It could be the life that you're living. It could be so many things, you know, it could be your wants. I, I don't know for you, I know for myself what it is, but I need you to declare this morning and say to God, God, I want to be set free from my blindfolds. I don't want to be blinded anymore. I want to walk according to your ways. I know that your thoughts are greater than mine. I know that the things that you have planned are greater than things that I can even imagine for myself, Lord. I know that the beginning or the beautiful things, the beautiful things you have in store for me in 2020 are better than the things that I know and I can see. Lord, help me so that I can see beyond my physical eyes and I can see with my spiritual eyes, Lord. Help me to look past my experiences. And more than anything, Father, help me to take this blindfold off. Lord, I want this blindfold to come off this morning, Lord. Not tomorrow, not next week, Father. I need this blindfold to come off today because I want to start to walk with you. I want to start to see things as you see it, Lord. I want to tap into the Holy Spirit, Lord. I want to fellowship with the Holy Spirit and to know what you are speaking to me. Father, help me to see. Help me to see with my spiritual eyes. For anyone who's struggling with their relationship with the Holy Spirit, ask God to help you to, to spend more time to hear the Holy Spirit, to fellowship more with him.